jigsaws. It takes a lot of patience to do jigsaws. As a child, I would uh, usually get so far with a jigsaw, but then reach a point where it was just taking far too long to finish. So I'd take a jigsaw piece and try, with the depth of my being, ram it in and force it into a shape that we just have to do. <laughs> this is ha what happens when you get a jigsaw piece that you don't really want in life, that doesn't really fit you. You force it in anyway. Habakkuk had been lamenting to God. Do you see your own people, God? Do you see what they're doing? There are people who should know how this game works, the, the Torah, and, and yet the foundational principles are not coming to bear in how they play this game. They're making a mess of the jigsaw picture. They're using their own set of foundational rules to make the best of a bad situation, using force, using violence to maintain a neat structure. What are you going to do, God? Habakkuk batters God with this diatribe. Look, God, wh where is the justice? Look at the violence. And a neat poetic reaction and repetition, one by one, God picks out these key words of Habakkuk's lament and smacks it back to him. Habakkuk, I am looking. I am acting. You say there is no justice. Let me show you what real injustice looks like. You say there's no violence. Let me show you what real violence looks like. The Babylonians are coming. They'll invade. They'll come like the wind. Think of the top predators, wolves, leopards, eagles. The Babylonians are so agile, so swift, so greedy. You think the wolves and leopards are to be feared. They have nothing, nothing compared to the terror that the Babylonians are going to bring to you. And as for the rules of the game, well, the Babylonians are going to make it up as they go along. The foundations of the earth will be shaken. Habakkuk, you feel like a small fish in this big sea, crying out in lament to your Yahweh God, will now feel the swell of these oceanic forces, feel the sting, feel the bite of these larger swirling predators of Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, they're coming for you. I wonder when Habakkuk heard that answer, did he think to himself, I'm sorry I asked the question. Because you see, the problem is when we call out to God for justice, we all want justice on our own terms. We have an idea of what shape in the jigsaw puzzle justice looks like. We want outcomes that are neat and tidy, that don't decenter us. We want solutions that look like us. For God to answer Habakkuk and say, the way I'm going to resolve my people's disregard for my laws is to use this foreign nation to come in and act for me. Really? That's a bitter pill to swallow. Why couldn't God have used his own people to sort it out? Invasion, that, that's such an uncomfortable idea. It's an even more uncomfortable idea that God uses the tools of invasion, the lawlessness, the violence, the torture, the suffering for his own purposes. What is going on? For us today, invasion is a foreign concept because many of us are on the side of taking land, not being the displaced ones. In Ireland over the years there has been invasion and displacement. In the north of Ireland, Roman Catholics were displaced uh, from their communities, driven out. In the south of Ireland on the borders, uh, in reaction to what was happening in the north, farming families like David's ancestors were driven out and they had to flee north. Growing up in the Troubles, displacement took on a much more sinister dimension. During childhood, the paramilitary organisation, the IRA, would give families 24-hour warnings to get out of the house. And so I remember waking up to hear that the family across the street ha had left overnight. They were gone. They had to disappear and the police had to come in the next day and pick up all their belongings and get ensure they were gotten to safety. Some in our congregation have experienced this kind of trauma, not having the time to pick up your belongings, but simply having to get out 
in Africa, in Asia. And this is a terror many of us will not experience. But for others of us, God has not answered in the way we wanted him to. We asked for things to get better and they get worse. An illness that is spreading and degenerative. A family situation that's crumbling and beyond recovery. And for all of us, Corona has invaded our lives, not just for a time, but this virus will stay and we have to adjust to that. So what do you do when the answer from God is not what you want? How do you handle it when God chooses to bypass his own people and use this pagan foreign nation as an agent for his own purposes? Sometimes I would simply rather have the jigsaw piece forced back in than the, the discomfort of total deconstruction in order to be reconstructed. But this does not bring me closer to God. Because if God only exists within the limits of our own understanding of how the world works, then this is not God. Anselm of Canterbury's definition of God, that than which nothing can be higher thought of. It must hold. We need a God who's bigger than us, bigger than our own understanding. A God who can use the worst things of our lives to bring about transformation. Austin Tashamburu is a pastor who had to flee for his life from Rwanda. I've talked about him before and he's ministered to many who've lost everything because of violence and war and he says the one book that he keeps coming back to as a kind of compass in times of disorientation is Habakkuk because it expands and grows a mature view of God's sovereignty, a trust in God, no matter what the circumstances are. So here are some of the things I want you to notice that are going on in Habakkuk 1. First of all, God answers Habakkuk. It mightn't be the answer Habakkuk wants, but God answers. God's not a silent God. He does not lament, let lament reverberate around in an echo chamber, but he responds to our prayers. God keeps his very being soft towards us, even when we are hard. And we know this because of the fine chronicling of detail with which God answers Habakkuk. Habakkuk had asked God to look at the violence and God replies, here's how I'm already looking at the violence. The, the details of the tactics that the Babylonians will use. Habakkuk, I know what they are doing. They'll move with the speed of a leopard. They have the predatory nature of the wolf, the greed of vultures, the fortresses that seem so impenetrable and masculine in the Hebrew language are now feminized as they're knocked down. The rulers of these small pieces of land might have seemed powerful at one time, but now they're humbled on this chessboard of the great kings of Mesopotamia. And, and then in doing that, God is drawing Habakkuk to widen his gaze. In the same way, when Job complained to God about his own suffering and God brought him out to look at the stars, God draws Habakkuk to this wider vision of nations mobilising according to the hand of God. The language moves out from me and my suffering to we, from singular verbs to the, the verse four verses to plural after verse five, drawing together all the people that are under God's gaze. God's vision is wide. It's not just for the chosen people, but God is watching the sweeping moments of super nations and tiny motions of sparrows. God is sovereign. After the financial collapse in 2009, Harvard researched and revealed that the degree to which businesses recovered was revealed and related to the ability of their leaders to collaborate and see the wider vision transitioning from I to we. But another quality emerging from God is mercy. You may think it's incongruous to think about a merciful God when the Babylonians are acting so mercilessly, pounding God's people. But the definition of mercy is getting something from a surprising source. Yes, God's people were going to face the merciless attack of the Babylonians. Some of them were going to be carried off into exile. But this suffering 
opened them out to realize they were not in control, but God was. The suffering opened them to realize that worship did not need to happen in the temple uh, of their own construction, but God was going to be there. God was going to be near. After Psalm 137, where the people cried by the rivers of Babylon, where we wept and remembered Zion, how can we sing songs in a strange land? They come to realize the answer, we can sing songs. We think God has left us behind, but God is actually near. And so not long afterwards comes Psalm 139. Where can I go from your presence, God? If I go to the heights, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Mercy, the surprising realization that God can come to us despite the worst circumstances. A mercy which opens the heart to worship again. Perhaps the people had gotten so hard, their jigsaw was too rigid and no longer connected and integrated their heart. But in the darkness of exploitation and violence and terror, there was treasure that God was there. The treasure of mercy that this violence would not last forever. You get a hint of this at the end of the passage. God makes it plain that the very pride and self-confidence that the Babylonians contained would be the seeds of their own downfall and they too will be crushed. Mercy, the realisation that God can use the worst of circumstances and bring surprising results. Mercy, the realisation that violence is part of our society, a broken society, but it's been answered by a loving God. God answered his own people this time with the Babylonians. Terrible violence, but it would come to an end. But one day God would answer his people again with terrible violence, but this time it would be violence taken in upon himself. God allowed himself to be invaded, to be displaced, to be pushed out of Jerusalem, outside of the city gate, to die, to be um, put into the grave to allow the good people of religion to do this to him so that all our expectations of justice would be transformed to realize this is love. This is love, that this is the Supreme Court. There is a Supreme Court that far transcends all human formulations of justice. There is a Supreme Court that doesn't look out for the interests of one nation, but all nations. There is a Supreme Court whose foundation is not violence, but love. The Supreme Court, which says, because of the resurrection, your worst thing will not be your last thing. And so the moment is to awaken. The moment is to look for the Habakkuks in our time who see it this way. To pray, Lord, open my eyes that I may see the work that you're already doing in this time. To realise we can't lock God into our own neat jigsaw puzzle and force him into the wrong shape because God can speak and respond in surprising ways through pagan nations like Babylon, through the burning bush like Moses, through Balaam's ass, through the still small voice like Elijah. God can speak and all the earth must tremble and listen. So what is our response today? For those of us who feel annoyed at God because the answer we're getting seems so much worse than what we would wish for. Tell them about it and see the answer coming. For some of us, it's simply to keep the conversation going with God because the very foundation of Habakkuk is this prayer, this dialogue, this back and forth with God. Next week, we'll be listening again to what Habakkuk says to God and then God will respond and that's the point to get to a point where we're continually communing with God regardless of circumstances, where we stay true to the faith. Jerome talked about lament without faith as being like this angry person striking out at God in an outburst then walking away. But here what's happening is this rehabilitation of lament with faith of this covenant community based not on their own concerns and their own constructions of Torah, but on covenant faith and love based in the righteousness of God. And so later on in our service, we will come to the table. 
we'll come to that place where we realize that God did answer our deepest hurts with the richest of love. We'll come to the table to realize that even our worst in life, even the hurts this week, even the places where we feel bruised by people trying to force us into jigsaw, jigsaw shapes that don't fit, God can use them. This week I was reading a book called Habakkuk Before Breakfast, a series of liturgies written by Brian Walsh based on Habakkuk. And there's this striking picture at the start of the book of communion wine being poured out from a bottle into a goblet. And this is how Brian Walsh describes the picture. It was drawn by someone called Iggy. And he writes, Iggy was a First Nations brother from Northern Ontario. He had seen some pretty bad times in his life. And for some reason, he kind of adopted our worship as part of his extended community. Iggy would show up sometimes at the back of the chapel, sometimes downstairs waiting for us when we came from worship to breakfast. And Iggy was a fine artist. One day he showed me this picture he'd drawn for the community, the bottle of wine, a chalice, a loaf of bread, some fruit, an open book, a staff, a music staff with the name of the community written on it, and a butterfly, the symbol of transformation. This was his gift to the community. But he didn't know what to write on the bottle, what vintage of wine, or might he just put the name of our community, the time of the worship service? Or might he put Kelly's on the bottle? Kelly's is the cheapest and most potent wine that the homeless folks drink. Should we put Kelly's on the bottle, Iggy asked. Yes, I reply, that's exactly what should go on that bottle. If our worship is about anything, then surely we should be about taking terrible wine, a wine of heartbreak, of sorrow, and asking Jesus to make that wine holy, a sacramental wine, the wine of the new covenant in his blood. And so shortly after Kelly's was put in the bottle, shortly after the book, Habakkuk before breakfast was finished, Iggy fell ill. There was a 24-hour vigil at his bedside in the intensive care unit. And while he was in that unit, we placed his picture on the communion table and someone would take the wine and the bread on Iggy's behalf. The body of Christ broken for Iggy. The blood of Christ shed for our brother Iggy. And so our brother Iggy returned to the Creator Iggy didn't hear any of the sermons in this book. Iggy didn't need to. He already knew. Jigsaws. What if today, dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, instead of trying to force your way into a jigsaw picture that no longer fits, simply say, take my failures, Lord. Take my broken pieces take it to the cross and tie my heart to the infinite love of my creator and forever keep me united to the love that forged this universe together. Take it all, Lord, and transform it. May it be so in our lives today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.